Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar for the request for proposals for using evidence-informed interventions to improve health outcomes among people living with HIV. I'm going to turn it over to Mar Marvell Terry to get us started. Thank you so much. My name is Marvell Terry. I use pronouns he, him, his, and I am joined today by my colleagues at H United and the Fenway Institute. Jointly for this funding opportunity, we will be known as the Coordinating Center for Technical Assistance, which you'll get more information about later in this presentation. The objective of this webinar is to familiarize potential applicants about this funding opportunity. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Age United website. This will allow you and others who might not be on the call to refer to it in the future. This webinar is in listen-only mode. You can listen via your computer, speakers, or your phone using the conference number located in the top right of your screen. You can also submit questions at any time using the Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen. We will answer all questions at the end of this webinar. Today's agenda for the webinar will be as following. We will provide a welcome. We will give an explanation of the summary of funding as it relates to this funding opportunity. You will hear about the respective teams, Age United and the Fenway Institute. There will be a program overview followed by an overview of the funding opportunity. You then will hear about the eligibility and focus areas of the interventions. Finally, you will hear about the site selection process, how to apply, and the timelines, and closing with giving you an opportunity to ask any questions. This funding opportunity has been made possible by the Health Resources and Service Administration, also known as HRSA. The mission of the HIV and AIDS Bureau within HRSA is to provide leadership and resources to assure access to and retention in high quality, integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people living with HIV and their families. The type of award is a cooperative agreement. The start date is April the 15th, 2018. The formative phase is April the 15th, 2018 through July the 15th, 2018. The project period is 18 to 33 months, depending on, upon the intervention that you have selected. Total funding is up to $170,000 each to 24 intervention sites, six sites per focus area. Intervention sites funded through this new initiative will receive funding over an 18 to 33 month period dependent upon intervention. Therefore, your project period end date may vary. AIDS United mission is to end the AIDS epidemic in the United States through strategic grant making, capacity building, policy, technical assistance, and formative research. Age United leads the charge for responsive and effective federal, state, and local policies that benefit people with and at risk for HIV. We invest in innovative models to meet the needs of communities affected by HIV and AIDS. We also launched strategic grant-making initiatives that have directly funded more than 104 million to local communities 
and have leveraged more than $117 million in additional investments for programs that include but are not limited to syringe access, access to care, capacity building, HIV prevention, and advocacy. And we do all of that by advancing advocacy on sound public policy, strategic grant making to affected communities, targeted and tailored capacity building for organizations responding to the epidemic, and research and evaluation to inform the field. I now would like to introduce you to the AIDS United team that will primarily be responsible for working on this funding opportunity, also known as the Coordinating Center for Technical Assistance. We have Valerie Rochester, the Vice President for Program Strategy at AIDS United, Aaron Nortrup, Director of Program Operations, Vinton Hill Jones, Senior Program Manager. I am Marvell Terry. I'm the Program Manager. And we also have joining us today Hannah Bryant, Program Manager, who works on our special projects of national significance and will provide technical assistance today on how to apply for this funding opportunity. I will now introduce Dr. Linda Mark who is the National Implementation Director for the Evidence-Informed Interventions. Thank you, Marvell. Again, I am Dr. Linda Mark. I use pronouns she, her, and hers. I serve as the National Implementation Director for the Evidence-Informed Interventions. Fenway Health was founded in 1971 with a group of students and community members in the Boston area. Its growth was fueled by people coming here from all over New England with what turned out to be the early signs and symptoms of HIV AIDS. Fenway Health has worked hard at its mission to keep the entire LGBTQ community in focus. And Fenway Health also serves other marginalized and disenfranchised communities who are diverse across race, ethnicity, housing, socioeconomic, and immigration status. Currently, about 50% of patients identify as LGBTQ. We've always used an integrated primary care model serving over 2,000 patients living with HIV. We also serve 2,500 patients who self-identify as trans or gender non-conforming and we have behavioral health patients. The Fenway Institute was established to focus our efforts in education, research, and policy. We celebrated 15 years as an institute in March 2017. The Fenway team consists of Dr. Alex Karagalan, who is the director for the Division of Education and Training. I am the National Implementation Director for the Coordinating Center for Technical Assistance. Masa Masakwai is the National Coordinator for the Center for Technical Assistance. Sarah Mitnick is the Operations Manager for the Division of Education and Training. Tim Michael is a Program Coordinator in the Division of Education and Training, and Reagan Wicklin is the Program Assistant for the Coordinating Center for Technical Assistance. Today, I will be presenting on the Program Overview. 
The Evidence-Informed Interventions Initiative is a four-year initiative to facilitate the implementation of evidence-informed interventions to reduce HIV health disparities and improve HIV health outcomes. The goals of this initiative include improving retention into care among people living with HIV, improving treatment adherence among people living with HIV, and improving viral suppression for people living with HIV. In summary, this initiative will be the implementation of effective and culturally tailored evidence-informed interventions that address social determinants of health in people living with HIV. The evidence-informed interventions that have been selected will be adapted based on the needs of target populations using an implementation science framework. This framework seeks to examine outcomes of the program that are focused on the acceptability, adoption, cost, feasibility, fidelity, and sustainability of the intervention at a program site. This type of information will be collected from program sites who are implementing these interventions. The interventions that have been selected will focus on four priority areas. The first will be improving health outcomes for transgender women. The second will be improving HIV health outcomes for black men who have sex with men. The third will be integrating behavioral health with primary medical care for people living with HIV. And the fourth will be identifying and addressing trauma among people living with HIV. I will now turn it back to Marvel Terry. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present the program overview. Thank you, Linda. Now I will turn it over to Vinton Hill Jones, Senior Program Manager at AIDS United. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to talk with you today about the HIV care continuum and um, diagnosing, uh, linking um, to primary care, and achieving viral suppression for people living with HIV are important steps towards ending the HIV epidemic in the United States. The HIV care continuum has five main steps or stages, including HIV diagnoses, linkage to care, retention in care, antiretroviral use, and viral suppression. The HIV uh, care continuum provides a framework um, that depicts a series of stages a person with HIV engages in from initial diagnosis through their successful treatment with HIV uh, medications. It definitely shows um, the proportion of individuals living with HIV or individuals diagnosed with HIV who are engaged at each stage. And as it relates to the HIV care, uh, care continuum, it also allows for recipients as well as planning groups to measure progress to uh, direct HIV resources to the most impacted. And so uh, by closely examining the proportion of people living with HIV uh, engaged in each stage of the care continuum, policymakers and service providers are able to pinpoint where gaps may exist in connecting people living with HIV to sustain quality care and to implement system improvements and service enhancements that better support individuals as they move from one stage in the continuum to the next. And so the Fenway Institute in partnership with AIDS United was selected to serve as the Coordinating Center for Technical Assistance or the CCTA. In consultation with HRSA, the CCTA will select up to 24 intervention sites 
to fund via awards up to uh, $170,000 per year, as mentioned earlier, to support the development as well as implementation of interventions within the four focus areas. The CCTA will provide technical assistance to the selected sites in implementing uh, the interventions as well as providing support to the sites to create a plan for addressing the long-term sustainability of successful interventions. The University of California, San Francisco Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, or CAPS, was selected to serve as the evaluation center. In consultation with HRSA, the evaluation center will coordinate the evaluation of this initiative using an implementation science approach, focusing on the process of implementation while also evaluating the ability of specific interventions to improve HIV care. Um, <clears throat> The, as well as the continuum outcomes of linkage, retention, and viral sup uh, suppression among uh, client participants. Uh, once sites are selected, the CCTA will conduct a brief organizational assessment with each site. This assessment will inform what uh, technical assistance will be necessary for each site and will assist in the adaptation of evidence-informed interventions for the selected site. Sites will be required to implement the adapted interventions for which they are funded within the awarded uh, project period. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Marvell Terry. Thank you so much, Vinton. Now I will talk about the eligibility and introduce the four focus areas and the four interventions for each. To be eligible, you must currently be funded by the Ron White HIV AIDS program, recipients or sub-recipients providing direct services, inclusive of sites providing core medical services and or supportive services directly to clients. You must not currently be implementing the same or similar intervention as the one selected under this request for proposal for funding. And you must demonstrate a pre-existing relationship with an outpatient ambulatory health services provider or in-house outpatient ambulatory health services that will be able to collect and report the applicant's viral load test retention, and, and antiretroviral adherence, et cetera. The first evidence-informed intervention focus area is improving HIV health outcomes for transgender women. The selected interventions for improving HIV health outcomes for transgender women are healing our trans women for tr healing our women for trans women the second one is healthy divas the third one is life skills and the fourth one is transgender women engagement and entry to care The second evidence-informed intervention focus area is improving HIV health outcomes for black men who have sex with men. The first selected intervention is antiretroviral treatment and access study. The second one is motivational interviewing peer outreach. The third one is Project Connect and Retention Through Enhanced Contacts. And the fourth one is Text Messaging Intervention to Improve Antiretroviral Adherence Among HIV-Positive Youth. The third evidence-informed intervention focus area is Integrating Behavioral Health with primary medical care for people living with HIV and AIDS. The first intervention in this focus area is a toolkit for the integration of behavioral health 
in primary care, which was designed by the AIDS Education and Training Centers, which is often referred to as ATEC or the AETCs, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, also known as AHRQ. The second is client-based buprenorphine. The third one is improving mood promoting access to collaborative treatment. And the fourth one is screening brief interventions and referral to treatment. The fourth evidence-informed intervention focus area is identifying and addressing trauma among people living with HIV and AIDS. The first one is cognitive processing therapy. The second one is trauma-informed approach and coordinated HIV assistance and navigation for growth and empowerment. The third one is seeking safety. And the fourth one is written emotional disclosure therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. We strongly encourage all applicants to thoroughly review the information provided in the appendix to the RFP for the intervention you are proposing to implement. Now I will talk about the site selection process. To be eligible, sites should be able to have the ability to reach and serve the population that they have selected to serve. Slight sites should be eligible, sites should be eligible with geographic distribution. Sites should have the readiness to implement the selected interventions and also have the ability to collect data for evaluation. Regarding the ability to collect data for evaluation, please note that proposal budgets must include a data manager position to manage data collection. We'll, we'll like to highlight that sites that provide direct medical care must budget for a .25 full-time employee data manager. Sites that do not provide direct medical services must budget for a .5 full-time employee data manager to collect and su submit the required data for the evaluation. Also, we would like to bring your attention in the request for proposal intervention site application, the project description that is worth 35 points. This section should describe how your organization would implement the selected intervention based on local level of requested funding. This should include a proposal of how the intervention might be adapted to fit your organization, strategies to ensure successful implementation, and how your organization will engage a substantial number of clients for the selected intervention. Present, you will see a map of the health and human services throughout the country. Also in our site selection process, we will make an attempt to distribute funding to the implementation sites across HHS regions of the country. The timeline for this funding opportunity is following. December the 8th, 2017, the requests for proposals were released. December 14, 2017 is the technical assistance webinar, which is currently happening today. January the 22nd, 2018 at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time is the deadline for requests for proposals. March 15, 2018 
We will send the notification of awards via email. April 15, 2018 is the date the grants start. And finally, July 12th and 13th, 2018 is the grantee convening that will be located in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Now I will introduce you to Hannah Bryant, who works at AH United and will provide technical assistance on how to apply for this funding opportunity. Thank you, Marvell, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Hannah Bryant. Um, I use she, her, and her pronouns, and I am a program manager at AIDS United, um, working on another HRSA-funded uh, initiative. Um, I'm briefly going to walk you through the steps to begin your application in Foundation Connect, AIDS United's online grants management system. Um, I'm also going to provide some overarching tips for using our online application system. I'm planning on covering some of the most commonly asked questions, um, but of course if you have any additional questions or concerns, please put them in the question box in the right-hand corner of your screen so that we can answer them during this webinar. Um, and you're also welcome to email us at ccta at aidsunited.org after the webinar has concluded. Um, so on AIDS United's webpage, um, which provides the background information, important links, and contact information for this RFP, you will see two red buttons, one that says apply now and one that says continue your application. If you're starting your application, please click the button that says apply now. This will lead you to an eligibility quiz and then to our application. If you've already started and saved an application, you can click the red button that says continue your application to access that saved application. Please do not click continue your application unless you have already started and saved an application for this funding initiative. You can't start a new application through the continue your application link. So once you click apply now, um, you will be taken to the eligibility quiz. Um, this is a series of four questions to determine your organization's eligibility. The questions mirror the eligibility criteria contained in the RFP. Um, as you're answering the questions, if you're deemed eligible, you will automatically be redirected to our login page and then to the application. If your answer to a question does not comply with the eligibility criteria, you'll be redirected to AIDS United's funding announcement webpage. If this happens and you have a question about the eligibility criteria, please reach out to us at ccta at aidsunited.org and we can discuss the, the criteria with you in more depth. Um, so as I mentioned, if, uh, you're, if you pass the eligibility quiz, you will be redirected to our main login page. If your organization has ever used Foundation Connect to apply for a grant or to submit a report to AIDS United, then you have an existing account and you can enter those login credentials here. If you're not sure if you have um, a, an account, please email us and we can check on that for you and let you know what the, your username is. If you know you have a username but can't remember your password, click can't access your account and you'll be able to reset your password. Um, if your organization has neither applied for a grant or submitted a report to AIDS United using Foundation Connect, you can click register and create a new account. Once you've created a new account, um, please save your username and password so you can return to this page and log in. Um, once you've successfully logged in, you should see the application for the Using Evidence Informed Interventions to Improve Health Outcomes RFP. This application contains text boxes for you to respond to the narrative questions noted in the RFP document as well as space for you to upload the required attachments. Um, so the, the narrative questions aren't contained in this screenshot, um, but you'll first see this. And I wanted to um, answer, some question, or answer some of the most commonly asked questions um, about these first um, few spaces. Um, so this request for contact information um, space is a, is a required question. Please click the magnifying glass and search your name in the box that pops up. 
you'll see your contact pop up and you'll be able to click the hyperlink to associate it with your application. Um, if you or someone else at your organization um, has worked in Foundation Connect before, you can link another contact to Foundation Connect. So again, click the magnifying glass, search a contact name, and click the hyperlink to associate it with your account. Um, this request for contact information, again, is a required question. Um, the next general question um, in Foundation Connect is these drop-down menus for who we should um, contact with application decisions. Um, both drop-down menus um, contain a number of values. You can tell us to contact the person who's submitting the application, um, the primary con project contact, or both if these are different people. Um, so you'll have to select a value from each of these drop-down menus, and that's a required field. Um, this proposal information section, um, this is a section that auto-fills. Nothing is required of you here. And then in the financial, financial summary box, finally, um, this amount that we're looking for, this is the total funding amount that you are requesting from AIDS United. Once you complete these four um, general questions, you'll see the text boxes that correspond to the narrative questions in the RSP. Um, so now I'm just going to provide some general tips about using Foundation Connect. Um, when you're using Foundation Connect, we'd ask that you please use Chrome or Firefox to, ac Firefox to access the online system. Um, frequently users experience some issues with Internet Explorer, um, so we just try to avoid that with using a different browser if at all possible. Um, uh, a good tip for using Foundation Connect is that you're able to save your application so that you can work on it in multiple phases. However, you have to answer all required questions before you're able to save um, your application or view the attachments tab. If you hit save but there's not text in all of the required fields, the application will not save. Um, so you can enter the word test or a single character or number into all the required in order to save the application before all of your narrative is complete. Um, once you have text in all the required fields, hit save often as the system will automatically time out if too much time passes. Um, lastly, while you're able to um, work on your um, application in multiple phases and save it, we strongly recommend that you complete your narrative in a Word document, um, then transfer it into Foundation Connect for two reasons. Um, sometimes your internet browser will crash or Foundation Connect will time you out, um, and we are not able to recover um, information that wasn't saved in the system. Using Word also allows you to monitor your page count um, and adhere to those guidelines set out in the RFP. Um, lastly, when you're copying and pasting your narrative from a Word document into the system, please paste as plain text. Um, any formatting, such as bullet points, bold, or italics, gets converted into HTML tags, which counts against your word count. So unfortunately, you're not able to format your text, and we'd ask that you paste this plain text into the system. So those are all of my general tips, and now I will turn it over to Sarah Hashmal, who's the Communications Manager at AIDS United, who will open our question and answer section. Hello everyone, we've had a very busy Q&A box. Many questions have been submitted. So at this time, we will start to answer the questions that have been submitted. What we, are, we have 30 minutes, so hopefully we'll get through everybody's questions, but any questions that we will not have time to answer, please submit them and we will respond and share the answers on the AIDS United RFP page after the webinar. Um, so, to kick us off with questions, we've received a number of questions about the total funding amount for the grant. Is it $170,000 per year or for the whole grant time period or must you apply for that maximum? Can we get a little bit of clarity on the grant amount that people can apply for? Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Erin Northrup. I'm the Director of Program Operations here at Age United. I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Um, and the answer to that question is the $170,000 maximum is per year rather than for the duration of the, the funding. Um, so that's an annual amount. Great. 
We've gotten several questions regarding page limits and character limits. Can you speak on if there are certain character limits per question and what the page limit for the application is? So this is Erin again. There's a 15-page limit for the narrative section. There's a 25-page limit that includes the narrative and the budget documents. So there's two budget documents. There's your project budget um, that's in the Excel uh, template that's on our website and also your organizational budget. The other attachments do not count towards the 25-page limit. Great. Thank you, Erin. Um, moving on to some eligibility questions. We have an organization that's a 501c3, and they would like to know if they are eligible to apply. Yes, yes, they are eligible to apply. Another health center is, as long as they're uh, direct, uh, directly or indirectly funded through Ryan White Funds. Great. Correct. A follow-up on the Ryan White question. A health center says they do not receive Ryan White Funds, but one of their partner organizations does. Can they apply in partnership with that other organization, or must you be directly Ryan White funded in order to apply? I think we'd like to address that in the FAQ so that it's um, very clear. So we will add that to the FAQ that will be posted on the website after today's webinar. So please refer back to our website for the FAQs after this. Great. Um, a community health center would like to know what OAHS stands for. Um, OAHS stands for Outpatient Ambulatory Health Services. Great. Um, can you already apply, or can you apply if you are already funded by AIDS United or another HRSA project? Yes, you can. Great. Um, we have a question about, um, the person says, when you say that you, to be eligible, you must not be implementing a similar intervention, what does that mean? So specifically, they are already serving trans women of color. So can they apply for a trans women of color grant? Yes, organizations that are uh, implementing or that are already serving the population um, that, that's listed uh, in the topic areas are able to apply. Uh, this stipulation is uh, speaking specifically to the intervention. Uh, if you're implementing the same intervention for the same population, um, you cannot apply to continue that intervention. Um, I'm receiving many questions about if these slides will be available. After the webinar, a PDF of these slides will be available on the AIDS United RFP page. A recording will also be made available. Um, many people have questions about the four focus areas. Do you pick one or must you apply to all four? Actually, you are only able to pick one, uh, one focus area and one intervention within that focus area. So you will not be able to uh, apply for multiple interventions nor multiple focus areas. Um, there's a number of questions about the geographic um, disbursement of the um, grant. Can you talk a little bit about what type of geographic diversity you're looking for, and someone also mentioned they see some cities listed in a map or in one of the resources. Are there certain cities that you're looking to fund over others? No, we are definitely, when we say geographic um, diversity, we definitely want to make sure that organizations from across the country, across different regions, uh, particularly HHS regions, are, uh, are funded for this, as well as uh, including diversity of um, major metropolitan areas as well as rural organizations. So we just want to make sure that um, this, this uh, opportunity is just not going to uh, major cities or just large organizations uh, or just organizations in one part of the country. Thank you. Um, we received a question about if this grant opportunity has any relation to another grant opportunity on HRSA's website? Um, is this the same grant as, um, or is this something different? The grant is called Behavioral Health Models to Improve HIV Health Outcomes for Black Men Who Have Sex with Men. That, that's a recently released uh, HRSA Special Projects of National Significance funding opportunity, and that's a separate funding opportunity than this uh, funding opportunity. All right. Um, 
if an organization is primarily serving transgender um, Spanish-speaking women, what should they do if an intervention is not culturally or linguistically appropriate? Um, we'd like to um, see if our, our colleagues at the Fenway Institute would like to address that question. Yes, this is Dr. Linda Mark, and the Fenway Institute will be providing technical assistance as necessary for each site and will assist in the adaptation of each evidence-informed intervention for the selected site. Thank you. Um, we've, we've received a few questions about the length of the funding on the, um, can you talk about how long the funding period is for the different programs and how that's determined? Depending upon the intervention that you select to implement will dictate the length of the implementation period. To find uh, the implementation period for each of the interventions, uh, those are noted in the appendix under the respective um, interventions. One second. The, if you um, select an intervention that you think will, your organization is able to implement in under 30 months, you can apply for less, um, fewer months or less time to implement the intervention. You might also submit a proposal that explains why you think that it will take the full duration of 33 months to implement the intervention. Thank you. Um, we have a question about IRB approval. Um, are these programs subject to IRB approval? We would like to defer to the Fenway Institute. Yes, this is Dr. Linda Mark. Based upon your site, there may be requirements to submit for IRB approval. If your site does not have its own IRB internally, we will provide technical assistance and guidance on how to obtain IRB approval. Thank you. All right. Um, sorry, I'm just going to take a minute to go through. Um, there's many questions here. Um, we received a question regarding um, demographics of uh, populations served, and there was a question about trans men specifically. Um, can you speak to if any of these interventions can work with transgender men? Absolutely. So the two focused populations are um, black men who have sex with men and transgender women. Um, certainly sites can apply to serve trans men through the focus areas of um, identifying and addressing trauma and integrating behavioral health. Um, sites may also speak to how they would serve trans men if they fall into the category of black men who have sex with men, um, and if a site's selecting an intervention to serve that focused population. Thank you. Can you talk about the staffing requirements um, specific for evaluation or medical provide, um, provision? So the, uh, there's a data manager position that is the one required staff position that must be included in the budget for these projects. Um, for sites that are medical providers, uh, this position needs to be a 0.25 FTE. For sites that don't provide direct medical services, this position must be a 0.5 FTE. And that's based on the um, the workload requirements of collecting the health outcome data that needs to be provided to the evaluation center um, for the evaluation of the overall initiative. Thank you. Is the program looking to fund, excuse me, um, community-based smaller agencies or do you prefer larger collaborative efforts? Absolutely. We definitely want to uh, fund a multitude of agencies, which includes large and small agencies and organizations will not be given a preference uh, due to their size. Um, going back to the staffing, are there any restrictions on the funding through this grant award? Besides the 0.25 FTE, is there a preference on how many facilitators would be um, supported through this intervention? No. 
what we want ap outside the requirements, it is up to the applicant um, to uh, explain uh, and make the justification for the needed resources to implement um, the interventions they're seeking to implement. Thank you. Um, we have a question for where someone can find more information about the evidence-based interventions and models that are supported through this um, initiative. More information around the links, scientific articles, and publications related to the intervention selected can be found in the appendix in the, interve inter in the intervention site application. If there are links or articles or publications uh, that you're not able to get from the appendix, um, you can email us at ccta at hunited.org with the list of the selected interventions that you would like more information on, and we will respond within 24 hours providing that information. Can you speak to the amount that's allowed for indirect cost rate on this uh, grant award? Yes, so uh, if an organization has an established um, negotiated indirect cost rate agreement, they can use that agreement. Um, for the purposes of this project, it should be a NICRA that's specific to um, other sponsored projects rather than to research. If there's not an established NICRA, then the organization can apply apply a 10% indirect cost rate. And if you look at the budget template on our website, those instructions are in the instructions tab for the budget. I have another eligibility question regarding an organization that's already doing something similar to one of these interventions. They say, if we serve the population but do not do so with an evidence-based intervention, and this is an opportunity to make their services more structured, would that disqualify them from applying? No, it will not. All right. These are great questions. Um, a few people are reporting an echo. Um, there should not be an echo. We are recording this, so um, it sounds okay on our end, and the recording will be available online. Um, you can listen in either over your computer or your phone. And then again, we're going to make this Q&A available um, on the RFP website on AIDS United's site. Just remember, if you're listening to uh, this recording on one device, you must mute the other device. Um, someone asks, can we apply if we have already been approved for another Ryan White grant? Yes. yes. Is the page limit double or single space? What we'd like to encourage, since this will be in our Foundation Connect, is to uh, limit uh, HTML formatting. So your best bet would possibly uh, be using either a uh, Word um, Word um, Word uh, program or uh, rich text to be able to minimize HTML um, spacing that may be included. So um, the better answer would probably be single space. Yeah, so um, just to, to echo what Vinton just said, this is Hannah. Um, if you um, double space your application in your Word document, that spacing won't transfer um, into, into the online system. You're not able to transfer that formatting. All right. We have a question of what does ACT stand for? AETC stands for the AIDS Education Training Center. Great. Um, we have a question about geographic diversity. Um, looking at the map, does that mean that there's going to be only one award for the whole Northeast? I think they're thinking about the numbers that are used for each section. You're not looking to have like four in each quadrant, for example. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and actually, just to go into a little bit more, more detail regarding that answer, um, the only time that that, that would be a, a major flag or a flag for us is that if there are five agencies in, that's funded on the East Coast and no, no organization that, that applies in the, in the South or somewhere else, we definitely want to ensure that all applicants applying across the country uh, are able to take advantage of this opportunity and want to ensure there's an even, uh, there's a dis, uh, there's a, a even distribution of uh, awarded sites across the country. 
Are there any particular interventions that HRSA is most interested in supporting? We believe that HRSA is uh, interested in supporting all the interventions, and so we encourage you to apply uh, for the intervention that is best for your organization and the population in which you serve. Can Puerto Rico apply? Yes. We have another question about how do you become Ryan White funded. Um, if can you speak to if you need to already be Ryan White funded to apply for this grant opportunity? Yes, for this particular funding opportunity, you would have already needed to receive Ryan White funds. Um, we suggest that you look uh, within your local jurisdiction uh, to see how best to get qualified to receive Ryan White funds. Do you want to just read that questionnaire? Yeah, there's a question about whether um, projects can support peer leaders, stipends for participants, and food and travel. Um, we certainly, uh, some of the interventions do include uh, peer staff, so that's certainly supported depending on the intervention that you select. Um, we will address the question about stipends and um, funding for food and travel in the frequently asked questions after today's webinar, so please check back on our website for more information on that. There was a, another question submitted about the data manager position, so just wanted to clarify again, the requirement for the data manager is uh, 0.5 FTE for non-medical sites um, and 0.25 FTE for medical sites. Can you elaborate on the requirement for an outpatient ambulatory health service um, for organizations that perhaps are looking for a priority area regarding transgender women? You can also, um, it sounds like that's a pretty specific question to your organization, so um, I suggest whoever asked that question and if you have other very specific eligibility questions regarding your organization, please send us an email at CCTA. I'm just going to move to the next slide so you can see that. CCTA at AIDSUnited.org. If we are understanding your question correctly, uh, an outpatient ambulatory health service must be able to collect and report viral load, retention, and antiretroviral treatment adherence. All right, we're continuing through. There's lots of great, great questions here. So one person says they're having trouble finding the proposal. Um, in the web link section on the right-hand side of your screen, if you click where it says Evidence-Informed Interventions and then hit the button Browse To, it'll take you right to the website for this RFP. All right. If we were a site that developed one of the interventions but no longer provide it, would we be able to participate in this um, project using the same intervention? For that question, that's um, fairly specific to a particular site, so we'd encourage you to contact us through the um, email address that Sarah just shared so we can talk with you individually about that question. Does the data manager position have to be located on site if a nonprofit has multiple office locations? The location of the data manager um, has to be where they can they can collect the data that's required for the evaluation purposes. Um, so if that can be done at a site separate from where services are provided, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. For the selected intervention, can we include staff training for the proposed intervention in our budget? That is, uh, that's definitely something that can be added um, as long as the uh, proper justification is included as far as how it will uh, attribute to 
um, the successful implementation of the intervention. What are the reporting requirements for this grant? So the reporting requirements to the evaluation center will include submitting um, patient health data to the evaluation center on a regular basis. If you look at the um, evaluation requirements section in the RFP, we'll talk more about that. There'll also be narrative reports required to AIDS United on a set schedule that will be um, shared with sites once they are selected for funding. We'd also like to um, clarify, uh, there have been some questions about the outpatient ambulatory health services. So we want to make sure that it's clear that um, if sites do not provide outpatient ambulatory health services or direct medical services, they must have an established relationship with an organization that does provide those services so that they can access the health data that must be reported to the evaluation center. Um, so one of the eligibility requirements for that reason is an established relationship with an outpatient ambulatory health services provider um, so that that health outcome data can be collected for clients served through the project. What is the ideal number of clients that an organization should hope to serve through one of these interventions? And is there um, a requirement of the number of people who would be living with HIV? There is no requirement uh, for the number of clients uh, that you serve. Um, there, there also isn't a requirement for the number of people living with HIV uh, that you serve. Uh, but we also indicate in our request for proposal uh, that you do uh, try to involve people in the implementation of your particular intervention that are living with HIV. One organization operates multiple sites throughout um, a region. Can they apply to implement an intervention that they're currently doing at one site to start doing it at another site? No. The, this, um, the stipulation for that uh, extends to the, uh, the organization. So if your organization is implementing that at one of its sites, um, that is um, a stipulation for not being able to apply. How many organizations do you plan to fund through this initiative? Up to 24. Um, we have a question about one of the attachments, the diversity matrix. They um, are, 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 this person does not collect the um, demographic information about their staff, and if they display all answers as unknown, will that hurt their application score? No, so the diversity table um, has a section for explanation, so if your organization does not collect that data so can't report it, we would ask that you explain that in the diversity table. It's still a required attachment, but we would ask that you submit that that um, explanation within the diversity table. Is travel to the required meetings budgeted um, separately or should that be included in your application? And so just to clarify, I think this person is talking about the grantee meetings and convenings that will be held throughout the year. Mm -hmm. That uh, actually, and once you access the budget template, it will also reflect this, but uh, it is, it is um, identified that you would need to include that with your proposal submission of the budget as part of the 100, uh, up to $170,000. We have another question about um, the OAHS. So again, I think that stands for, can you tell me? Outpatient Ambulatory Health Services. So if you are a medical services provider, do you still require an MOU with an OAHS site? No. Um, that, that's particularly related to if you do not have one on site. But if you do have one on site, you can utilize that for your data collection purposes. Um, going back to the questions regarding the total grant award amount, if someone, if an organization isn't applying for a whole year, maybe theirs will be more or less, is $170,000, can that be prorated for the amount, their award length, or is that just a fixed maximum? 
So the 170,000 is a fixed maximum. Um, what I can say as an answer to the question is uh, you can write um, a budget amount of any amount that you would need to implement the intervention up to $170,000 per year. All right, and it looks like we have one minute left. So um, I'm going to see if we have one more question here, see if anything comes in. And know that this is not your last opportunity to ask us questions. You can always email us at CCTA at AIDSUnited.org. So I'm going to turn it over to Marvell to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sarah. Again, we would like to it, uh, reiterate, uh, if you have any questions, please email us at CCTA at AIDSUnited.org. We prefer that you submit questions and requests for assistance via email with your organization's name and the subject line of the message.